So yeah, good morning. Uh, for me, it's a bit it's a bit emotional to be here. Uh, Twenty years actually from my PhD defense, and uh, great to see my old teachers, uh, Frick and uh, Alfred Stein, also my promoter. Um, also see that uh, not not much has changed, but it's still everything very tidy. I don't I don't feel that's been any erosion uh, in the building and. I've seen that you, you went through some transformations and also congratulations on the new place in advance. Um, I, uh, I met uh, Yi Jian uh, at the uh, surf um, and I think he maybe read some of my work and we started chatting, Leandro, uh, Yi Jian and me, and, and then somehow we said, hey, let's, uh, let's catch up. And I said, I haven't been to ITC a long time. Uh, here we have excuse. I can now come and visit. I think I haven't been actually more than eight years here uh, by accident, no, no, on no purpose. Um, and then we said let's have a meeting, and then this meeting turned into this uh, mini symposium. How things usually develop. Uh, but just to uh, give you a background, uh, how how we finish here, it's there was a very interesting uh, a seminar organized by Surf. Uh, it was on digital twin earths uh, for earth sciences, and um, you can uh, read about it. There's an article, and I think they uh, put a, a slides presentation, so you can uh, you can go to this website and see. Um, uh, this is me back at ITC. This is my graduation day, 20 uh, PhD defense day, uh, 20 years ago. Um, you see, I, I changed a bit. I think uh, maybe a, a bit of hair erosion. Uh, <laughs> um, also some extra extra weight, but in, in between, I don't know if you followed, uh, I, I stayed in academia, I, I worked a bit in uh, Italy for European Commission GRC, and then somehow I finished in Amsterdam at UFA, and then after that in Wageningen, and then in the meantime I find, uh, find my purpose, uh, what really I'm, what I'm most useful for, uh, usually a, a couch for my children. Um, so uh, yeah, so many things change in between. Um, and as I said, it's for me very symbolical to be here after 20 years, see you all, um, and uh, also see that uh, uh, you are still very active and still alive and kicking in uh, geoinformation science. I see the many department changes, I just saw this new department names. Uh, I think it's a good transformation, I think there's, I see a lot of ambition, especially with the going to 4D modeling, uh, thinking about uh, new technologies, AI, Etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, we started Open Job, uh, uh, it will be soon five years ago. Um, it's a very funny story. Uh, I always had an inclination to focus primarily on non-for-profit uh, public projects. Uh, and I've been uh, organizing or co-organizing this summer school for almost uh, 12 years. And I improvise a lot with these summer schools um, uh, usually we will be very low budget um, and uh, we moved around different places around the world and Europe and we begged people to give us a place to run the summer school and all the lectures were volunteers and then one day I said ah, we, let's open a bank account so at least we can pay things and then they told me if you want a bank account you need to register foundation and then, so we registered this uh, open geo hub. And, uh, and since then, yeah, we uh, won some projects and won some funding, and now we are uh, 20 staff, and then one person came one day and says, look at what we do, and say, you're a deep tech organization. I never heard of that term, a deep tech. Uh, uh, well, there's a link you can read about, but actually it's kind of like a very productive, uh, uh, creative people uh, dealing on the edge of technology and testing you know, new uh, barriers of technology. And, uh, and now we have uh, seven projects, and uh, we'll talk about them today. Uh, uh, we came with uh, almost 10 people, so we have quite some talks. And uh, so you will see different projects we're doing. And usually it's a Horizon Europe. We have uh, also a project with the WRI, uh, World Resources Institute, uh, Woodville Climate uh, Research Center. We also do for UNCCD. So uh, quite some projects. Uh, usually we build data platforms. Um, we, we build data, we build data platforms, so we build this ecodatacube.eu. Uh, our probably most ambitious is project is openlandmap.org. Uh, we also contribute to open source spectra library, naturemap.earth, etc. Um, and we work closely a lot uh, 
uh, with colleagues from YASA, IFKI, uh, LAPIG in uh, Brazil, Aarhus University, 52 North, Max Planck. So we work very closely with some uh, European and international institutions. Um, when I was still at ITC, you know, uh, at that time, the open source was not the mainstream. Let's be honest. I mean, there was a different uh, software in use, and uh, I also use Ilvis, uh, uh, but it was not the open stream. And, um, and uh, one of the first p person I met that really influenced me was uh, actually Edzer Pebesma. He's now a professor at IFKI in Munster. And he started, uh, together with Roger Bivan, they started this little movement to make uh, uh, support for spatial data in R. It just started like a one meeting and they kind of recognized that they want to uh, develop in open source. They also flirted a bit with these commercial uh, corporations, but uh, they said, no, you know what, we, let's try this R. And R is like this silly, silly software name that uh, just a one letter um, uh, software name that um, kind of uh, uh, came out of these uh, geeks that made the S, uh, S language but they were not allowed to say S because it was commercialized, so they had to call it some other letter. And they said the R counts before S, so they call it R. And, um, and both of the main developers of R, uh, the uh, first name starts with R, so it's, it was the destiny. And uh, so they call it R, and then we started using this R, and they made this um, spatial support, and then uh, we started running the summer schools, and then also Marcus Netteler joined, and and other people making some uh, R packages, and, uh, and I call them giants of open source. Uh, and especially uh, here, especially uh, these three, the uh, Edzer and uh, Roger Bivan and Marcus Nettele, they're really, really giants. They made so much contributions and uh, they spent, basically they dedicated whole life uh, to open source. Uh, and so that's how we started with summer schools, and then from summer schools came the Open Geo Hub. And now we're doing uh, so many projects, uh, so that's a, that's a little evolution of just uh, in five minutes. Um, now, when you look at the open source, uh, I notice now many Dutch universities also uh, changing their curricula and putting directly open source uh, software and curricula. And I notice some of them, they do it because they just say, oh yeah, okay, it's, we, we don't have to pay the license anymore, you know, it's great, we save the money. And I think it's the worst reasoning to start uh, with open source. Um, so, because in open job we can afford, and we pay commercial software, we pay quite some software, because if the software is cutting edge, and if it does the work you need, uh, and if it's, you know, competitive price, go ahead and use the commercial software. There's not, no problem. But um, if you want to do something more reproducible, high transparency, if you want to contribute to the public uh, goal. Uh, and also, if you want to meet the, some of the smartest people, because interestingly, open source, you finish with very, very creative, intelligent people. And I was also uh, curious about the, how come there's such a high correlation. And often these people are, yeah, they are very easygoing, uh, very creative, so they will create something that for commercial business will be above some norm, let's say. Um, and uh, the other thing I want to say is that uh, when I was here the, doing a PhD here in uh, Enschede, I went uh, to see, uh, I went to, to this IFDA, uh, uh, so that's an international documentary uh, film festival. It's one of the biggest in the world. I highly recommend going. It's every year in Amsterdam. Uh, so I went there and I saw this movie, Remix Manifesto, and, uh, and this movie kind of changed me completely. It's like the, when you read some significant book in your life and completely change your mindset. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons, you, you know, we have Open Geo Hub because I watched that movie and it's about how uh, global corporations, big corporations basically took over the, um, the things, the creative things that we produce and they commercialize it. And it is really this open, you know, open is today everybody uses like a bit of a, a fashion, you know, oh, we have open science and, you know, Edward will say like, how do you mean there's open science? Is there any, is there closed science? I mean, they cannot be, you know, science can only be open. I mean, you make it that people can reproduce it or, you, you know, it's a religion, right? So, um, so, but very interesting with the, this uh, movement for open source is that 
uh, it's not the mainstream, it's not even close. You know, 98% of scientific publications are copyrighted and they're behind the paywall. And if you, there's a famous Dutch company also, Elsevier, that, you know, if you want to go and download a PDF to read some, your article that, you know, I wrote the article, you reviewed it, I don't know, and to uh, access this article, you have to pay $35. And, and to buy a copy, printed copy of Harry Potter, you pay $12, right? So 98% of uh, research is uh, copyright behind the paywall. Um, most of organizations still use uh, commercial clause so software. Uh, so, um, so I saw that it's a bit radical documentary. I highly recommend watching it. Uh, and, um, but it influenced me a lot and I realized yeah, yeah, that the world is not a fair place, not equal opportunity place. And the profits are just going to grow for the ones that already make enormous profits. Uh, the other thing that uh, influenced me a, lo a lot, um, it's uh, reading the book of Lawrence Lessig, which comes in that documentary about free culture. And that kind of explains, uh, explains a lot um, this idea of, you know, the, the person, Lawrence Lessig is the professor from Stanford and he's one of the founders of the Creative Commons, you know, the license that you see by and I don't know, this is him basically, his idea, his baby. Uh, and he uh, made this book called Free Culture, also highly recommend reading it. It explains also the philosophy uh, open, of open source. Um, and so what I like about the, the uh, people in open source? Well, I also notice in open source, uh, people are very, like this sharing culture, it's amazing. It's really inspirational. And these people really have a big heart. They don't have a secret agenda, you know, that they will help you uh, if you pay them or if you do something for them. It's literally, they just share and they just help. Um, and as they do that, uh, they, um, they help increase our social intelligence, not only their social intelligence, they increase all uh, social intelligence for everyone. Um, and they, p these people have also strong drives and also what they discovered that these people have very cool hobbies, very interesting correlation. Usually they are, uh, usually uh, discovered music, uh, music, then uh, usually has some creative hobby, artistic hobby, and uh, so, yeah, very uh, interesting people. So now when I look through my career, having uh, this flashback, I mean, 20 years after PhD, so what is the biggest gains, again, being in academia? What is my biggest gain going to academia? And, you know, is it my career, my salary? Uh, is it the house I bought, you know? Uh, so when I look at that, you know, what's the biggest gain? The biggest gain is that I managed to meet these people and make friends with them and make, make journeys and make adventures with them. This is my biggest, this social gain of just meeting these people, Edze, Roger, and, and Marcus, you know, and hanging out with them. This is my biggest gain. That's what my biggest happiness is. Um, and um, the other thing I want to talk about uh, when it comes to Open Science is the book by Daniel Pink Drive. Uh, if you haven't read it, uh, it's, a, it's a must read. Uh, it's really also an eye opener. And um, Daniel Pink is an American uh, anthropologist. Uh, he looked at the, in capitalism, the carrot and stick. Uh, so the carrot and stick, you know, if you have an employee, if you have a group of employees and you say, uh, I need you to do more work and you give them more carrots, or you use a stick if they make a mistake. And so most of capitalism based on carrot and stick. You want to, you say, hey, we have this uh, um, more work, so let's give higher salaries, uh, or let's make uh, more strict rules, so they have to be very strict to do things. The carrot and stick. And so they look at the carrot and stick, and they said, the carrot and stick works. If you need to transfer um, furniture, from here to the other, if you increase people's salary, they will work harder, they'll transfer it faster. For the routine work, carrot and stick, it's fine. You know, and you have to pay more if you want something faster, and you have to have rules. But when he came to creative work, and creative work is problem solving, designing stuff, making new designs, you know, uh, making new solutions, thinking out of box, he applied the same carrot and stick and they did experiments and they noticed that the productivity was the same 
or it got even worse. They had these hackathons where they would give an award of a couple of thousand dollars if they solve a problem. And then they doubled the amount and they saw the people perform worse. It was very interesting. So he published this book called Drive. And uh, I don't have time to talk about it. I could have a whole uh, day talking about this. But he said, actually, the, when you look also in open source, how come open source makes software? How come most of internet runs on Linux, which was made by few geeks? In free time, there was no budget. There was no salary. And how come now we, we have most of internet running on it? Something like fundamental. And uh, so he said there are three things. Remember this, it's the autonomy, master, and purpose. Autonomy is giving our people freedom to design things and do things their way. Uh, that motivates also enormously. Mastery is giving people chance to become good at something. Uh, and then the purpose telling them, you know, that something we're doing is really beyond the scope of their lives or beyond the scope of civilization. Um, so please read that book. Uh, so we started this Open Geo Hub, and um, at one moment uh, last October we went to Washington D.C. and um, and I made you know this Open Geo. I didn't really have ambition to be like a world player. I don't know, but I finished. I copied this slide. There was a meeting of the Loud Carbon Lab project, and we just became a member of that group. And then I saw my, this logo that we made is shiny, and I designed it ourselves. And I saw this logo between the Google, NASA, and European Space, Ag Space Agency and ESRI. I saw this logo and then I noticed, okay, now actually uh, we're now quite, <laughs> quite big uh, on the world map. So, um, and uh, we've been growing ever since then. Uh, this is the uh, Land Carbon Lab project. I think it's over 100 million and we will be mapping uh, global grasslands, uh, livestock uh, density. We are very interested in space time um, our main focus is on space time and modeling uh, changes at high resolution and of course uh, all the data will be open and it will be um, made uh, with unrestricted access. Um, then also in Europe we are, we are the leader, we are leading the uh, open net monitor cyber infrastructure uh, which is basically software, the EO data and community and we are almost 20 partners. Uh, we just launched uh, last year, we launched in uh, Wageningen. Uh, now we just finished implementation plan. And through this project, I would like to collaborate with ITC uh, because we, we can build a lot of things and uh, we are uh, interested to really collaborate and to see what's the missing data, what with data that will be useful for your projects, uh, what's the software that maybe uh, could help you speed up your computing or uh, um, solve some problems. And so we look forward to collaborating with ITC on this project. As I said, it's a European project. So the real focus of this project is to support the European Green Deal and this uh, uh, digital uh, uh, twin earth uh, type of projects and then the U European Data Science Cloud. Uh, and we lead, uh, uh, we lead quite some outputs. Uh, they are split into uh, computing edging, so the work package 3 is on computing edging, work package 4 on the in situ data, and then work package 5 and 6 is the European and global uh, use cases. Uh, so, uh, and we're going to talk about it, uh, so I'm just announcing just a teaser for presentations today. Then we just kick started the IFO Soil Health, uh, also more focus on soil data, uh, also European scope. Uh, we just kick started, it just started the 1st of January. Uh, and we also, we are the biggest partner here, so we'll be making a European soil data cube uh, and methodology for soil health. Um, it's quite complex, you know. Uh, now I notice in data science, doing data science without understanding electrical engineering, computer science, you know, the remote sensing technology, it's not possible. So you have this uh, really new satellites coming up and then the, we are interested in 2000, 2020. Plus, and but you can see there's a, you know there's no there's no perfect uh, uh, Earth observation data, so there's too little overlap. So you have to do this fusion uh, techniques and and also point data. There's some uh, the data is for the recent years they're still uh, just being produced. So uh, so it's lots of complexity, but uh, the idea is to try to integrate that. We also believe in uh, citizen science. We think. Possibly a couple of years, there's a device cost about 900 euros. You put it on your mobile phone, 
and you're on the field and you're doing science and so everybody could do science. It's common now in the biodiversity projects, it's common in the um, uh, biologists use it, you know, these apps, uh, iNaturalist and things, and now we want them also for soil science. So we would like to promote um, solutions where people directly in the field can have a scan of a soil, send it to the uh, cloud, share it openly, and then we can use it to do data mining and do uh, new projects. Um, the Eco Data Cube, a European environmental data cube, very ambitious with this. We would like to incorporate all open European data uh, environmental data and uh, put it in this data cube so it becomes uh, super easy for people to use, access, visualize. Uh, if you go to the, the URL, you will see just a data portal so you can immediately start playing with data animating. Um, and also, we, as I said, we are very interested in the um, uh, space time. So we want to go back. Many people like now fancy thing in uh, remote sensing is just it certainly gets better and better, but we know more and more about the recent years. You know, we'll know more about 2023, 2024. But I, I'm not impressed with technology. I'm really interested to understand the processes and to use the technology, not to obsess with technology, but to use the technology to help solve the interesting th uh, things we are interested in. We are actually interested in the past. We would like to reconstruct the past. We want to increase the accuracy of the maps going, you know, 30, 40 years back, and then understanding all the processes. This is the deforestation in Brazil over the last um, uh, 50 years. Um, so, uh, and then uh, we are uh, ambitious also data-wise. We realize these cloud systems and commercial companies are uh, something that, you know, can they can, you know, control the cost and they can control what you do. So we decided to make our own copy, uh, get our own copy of Landsat. It's a 1.3 petabyte, it's not so bad. Um, but it takes about two months to install everything, so we're working on that. And um, we're getting all this uh, data from, uh, uh, luckily, from, uh, uh, from Maryland. Uh, if you know this person on the picture, this is Matt Hanson, he's the... Uh, 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 head uh, um, um, lead of the head uh, sorry, head of the group in Maryland uh, 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 group called GLAD Global Land Analysis Discovery um, and so they show us their computing center and now we're getting the data and we are hoping to do last uh, uh, 30 plus years, we would like to do uh, 30 meter resolution full modeling, so have a full stack uh, monthly or bi-weekly data, uh, and then integrate all this data into one uh, uh, giant uh, um, environmental data cube. Uh, so just to quickly say what is the key to achieving open science, because that's what you came here. So uh, get better at Docker, GitHub, uh, our book down, write your science in computational notebooks. So that's number one. If you want to get good in uh, open science, Write your science in computational notebooks and learn about Docker also. I, it was quite painful. I also got into Docker. I hated it. <laughs> but uh, to do a reproducible, proper reproducible research without understanding Docker is not going to happen. Uh, then second tip, tip uh, publish research as a package. So today, uh, obsession is personal careers, right? We go, oh, I publish here, I publish there. But publish research as a package so submit a paper, but also submit your code, register your code, register input data, register outputs you get, and then provide a support channel. When people ask you, hey, I'm trying to reproduce a result, I'm getting this, well, how do I do it? You know, so provide, uh, publish research as a package. Um, then the, the third tip is, don't think it, you need a huge budget. You can use a lot of things which is actually for free and it is non-commercial, not for free as Facebook free, you know, the Google free, but they are funded by the European citizens only. Zenodo, um, uh, TIB, Open Science Foundation. So there's a lot of hosting services that you can use and you can put your data without paying extra. Uh, and then the last tip is uh, many people would just use open source. They would just say, oh, I use R, install it, ta, ta, ta. But they never contribute. They never do anything. And you know what? I'm not in open source. And we know who you are. We know the people. They just demand and they never contribute. And they trust me, you don't want to become a person like this. So uh, think what you can do for open source, not what the open source can do for you.
And with this thing, I uh, finish my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice presentation, Tom. I went a bit over time, I apologize. No, actually we have still time available okay. uh, for, for questions. So um, are there any questions from, from the audience? Yes. Just a second. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I've learned a lot from this. Uh, one of the things, um, your last comment about we know who you are. Um, is that inclusive or exclusive thinking of the ethical considerations moving forward? Because not every, if we think of, of learners, some learners are uh, quiet, passive learners, so they will take the information, reuse it, and then they will contribute it in different ways. They might not contribute it directly. So uh, my question is, with, with your last comment, we know who you are, are you then excluding people from continuing to use open source information because that's also uh, not inclusive in how people might work or reuse some of these things. Oh, thank you, it's a, it's a fair point. So, uh, so what I'm trying to say here, of course, I'm, we're not going to blacklist anyone. You know, we don't have time to blacklist people that just complain and don't help. Um, so what, I'm, what I was trying to do is like, Imagine you, you're in a house, you share a house as a student, I don't know, and you have like five people in a house, and, and then some things you have to do voluntarily, you know, you have to water the plants or, you know, because open source, there's nobody behind, there's no public funding, nobody will maintain it. Wikipedia, if we don't give money from time to time to Wiki, Wikimedia Foundation, Wikipedia will shut down because they, they will push to put commercials and to put stuff, and the founder always rejected it. He says, no, we'll never put commercials. We'll never be commercial. So it means that it is a serious thing to maintain it. And uh, some, some people just using it, eventually it can, the project will die. If everybody just uses it, but nobody does anything to clean up, just a little thing, you know, it might eventually die. And the best example is GDAL, one of the backbones of the GIS and nobody wants to say that, but this GDAL is the stuff we use every week, you know? If the GDAL didn't exist, so many of our projects would have been total pain. The two uh, main developers GDAL, they had a burnout, and the whole system was on the edge. You understand? And it was then serious because people started saying, look, uh, what's happening? There's no new version of GDAL. <laughs> what's happening? You know? And then, then they said, okay, we have to do something. And then they collected money and, and put something. So it's a different mentality. The only thing I'm saying is different mentality. But of course, I don't expect anyone to do, have to do anything. It's a voluntary system. It's a voluntary system. But if you think you can just go and grab and use whatever, we're going to collapse. You know, just consider it. It's like we're living in the same house and we have to help each other. Yeah, this is a very interesting discussion topic. Maybe it can continue during coffee break. So are there any questions? Yes, Rob. Thanks, and thanks, Tom. Um, I, I put some uh, observations in the HackMD document. Read those later. Um, thanks for your, for your presentation and insights about life. Uh, I have a point, especially to this slide. And that is your suggestion under bullet two of what you publish as a package. Uh, specifically, you talk about the code, and I think you, what you probably mean here is that code that takes your input data to output data. Um, but I would like to ask, ideally, beyond that sort of code, should we not also be publishing support code that helps you properly interpret the output data so that users of your output data could actually you know get the best out of that and not abuse the data or incorrectly use your data as you've output oh no i absolutely agree i mean i'm sorry if i maybe i implied code vaguely but uh, uh, i imply any code that help other people build upon your work uh, you know, when I, uh, I, I my self-reflection on science, you know, was why do I publish, why do I make, I mean, there is a bit of competition and ego, you know, I want to show this guy I'm faster to 
figure out something in science. But now that I'm, I'm, let's say I'm calm with me and you know, I'm getting in an age of zenith of my career, so then my flashback on the, why do I publish? Because I like to uh, uh, share uh, and uh, enable other people to create. That's, that's why I want to publish. So anything that helps other people in, uh, create on top of your work, I think that's why I do science. I want to enable, I want to inspire, enable people to create on top of my work. So I agree with you fully. Publish the code, make an extra code to make your data more accessible, explain how to access your data, how to use it, how to extend it, etc. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. We are in coffee time, by the way, so just uh, quick questions, please. Thanks for the great presentation. It really made my day so far. Um, I was wondering if you had a couple of uh, pieces of advice on how to persuade people beyond this inner drive on uh, why they should do open science and open source software development. Because the, the biggest, um, let's say, drive for, for survival in academia is right now publishing papers. So they're the tokens of academic career development. So publishing code is often not appreciated at all, or it's even discouraged. So how, how would you persuade people, especially people in higher positions of management, to, to acknowledge that this is even more important the way I see it than publishing a paper? Thank yes, you. no, I agree with you. Uh, we have this system in academia that you uh, promoted, uh, you know, basically, and especially like in country like Netherlands today, you promoted based on the acquisition, the money that you bring in, uh, or capacity to do acquisition. Or the second thing, the capacity to publish in just this uh, creme de la creme journals, you know. Um, so that, and that's a sad thing. And, and I don't blame uh, researchers to be too, uh, too much just uh, focus on just get it published, you know, right? I don't blame it on researchers. I fully uh, agree with you. It's the, the process of promotion and process of how you uh, deliver the funding, research funding, should be for me more than 50% based on how much you contribute to uh, public goods and creative commons and things. So. For me, that's no brainer, you know, so, and you can follow that, you know, you can follow, uh, today you have this uh, GitHub, GitLab, you have the Zenodo, you know, you can follow uh, the flow of, you know, people publishing, sharing and things, but we don't get promoted based on that, unfortunately, so that's, a, that's something I hope it will change, you know, so, um, but, uh, and how to inspire people? Well, I mean, I'm the living proof that open source also uh, pays off. I finish in these top cited uh, researchers, you know. I never had, the, I didn't even know about this. Uh, they put me in some uh, journal, I don't know, they publish about me. Then my mom told me, hey, you in the news and things. And I never, I mean, I never did my uh, academic career to, to, I didn't even know about that list, you know. But uh, why did I, uh, why did I got many papers, so many publications? And why is the Journal of Statistical Software number one journal in statistics? Why? because it's very low budget, go to the website, they have all open source, out of box, I'm improvised, you have to compile the paper yourself. Very low budget, but they're top, this is like a number one. So why? Because they make useful stuff and they enable other researchers. And so I made a lot of things that people just take and play and build other things. And then they sat it and, and somehow I started getting these papers with, you know, 2000 citations and things. Uh, so, so it is uh, for me, it's a no-brainer also if you want to make more impact and enable more people, you know, do open source, open data. But officially, you don't get rewarded. Actually, they will punish you. Corporations will punish you for releasing things. They, will, they might get fired if you release something that they will say it's our property. So. Okay, thank you very much.